Now let's focus on one story, Brexit, what the UK Prime Minister is doing, how the EU is reacting, and what could happen after Brexit, if it does happen, the UK-Nigeria relations. Two weeks ago, the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson suspended Parliament with the permission of the Queen. He said it was to give him more time to come up with a new plan and to negotiate with the EU since the UK MPs were not satisfied by his efforts so far. For three days, the court heard arguments on both sides whether Mr. Johnson acted unlawfully when he decided to suspend Parliament in the run-up to Brexit. A Brexit that is supposed to happen on October 31st and one that the Prime Minister has promised would happen no matter what, with or without a deal. Lawmakers think what he might be going for is a no-deal Brexit. Well, thankfully, the EU said last week Mr. Johnson and his team had presented a proposal. After weeks of receiving backlash from the British Parliament over his plans for Brexit, it appears the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson really was thinking of a plan. On Thursday last week, the European Union's Executive Commission did affirm the Prime Minister's team had submitted proposals in writing of how it would like the stalled Brexit deal to be amended. We have received documents from the UK and on this basis we will have technical discussions today uh, and tomorrow on some aspects of customs, manufactured goods and sanitary and phytosanitary rules uh, and then the discussions will also take place at political level because Michel Barnier, uh, the Commission's chief negotiator, will meet uh, Steve Barclay tomorrow on Friday. These are papers for now until we have actually looked at them in detail. I will not characterize them beyond being papers. Uh, our technical discussions, are, technical discussions are happening today and tomorrow so we take it from there. On its part, the UK said it had shared technical non-papers with Brussels, which reflect the ideas the UK has been putting forward, without going into further detail. But the EU said that even with the papers, every day counted now as the Brexit date nears on October the 31st. By Friday, Britain's negotiator Stephen Barclay arrived at the European Commission to hold talks with the EU's chief Brexit negotiator, Michel Barnier. Speaking to reporters later, he was optimistic on reaching a Brexit deal with the EU. Uh, there's a common purpose. We both want to see a deal. A very clear message has been given both by President Juncker and the Prime Minister who want to see the teams reach a deal. Uh, the meeting actually overran, which I think signals the fact that we were getting into uh, the detail and we'll have further discussions next week. But what's very clear from the statements from the Irish government is, like the UK government, they want to see a deal done. They recognise that no deal is not in the interests of the Irish government. So there's a common purpose both in Dublin, in London and here in Brussels to see a deal over the line. And I think the fact that the meeting overran today, we were getting into the detail, the technical teams will meet again next week. Uh, the Prime Minister and President Tusk are expected to meet in the UN uh, as well next week, uh, underscore the purpose there is on both sides to get a deal and that is what we're working very hard to secure. The Prime Minister on this part has been trying to build confidence among the people. During a visit to an army training base in southwest England, he dismissed a comment by the EU Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker about not being emotionally attached to the Irish backstop. The faster will go. Yeah. So we just keep, uh, that's one. He also said that Britain had made some progress in Brexit talks, but that the country should still prepare to leave the EU on October the 31st without a deal. Well, I don't want to exaggerate uh, the progress that we are making, but we are making progress. And what we need to do, so people understand, we need to find a way whereby the UK can come out of the EU and really be able to do things differently, not remain under the control of the EU in terms of laws and, and trade policy, which is the, the problem with the current agreement. But we want to come out in such a way as to protect Ireland, make sure there isn't a border, in a hard border of any kind in, in Northern Ireland, and, and make sure we protect the Good Friday peace process. Now, we think we can do that, and we think we, we can find a way forward. On the sidelines of the discussions, Britain has been working on improving bilateral relations. On Friday, Trade Minister Lee Truss signed a mutual recognition agreement with Japan's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Toshimitsu Motegi, to ensure business continuity as the two countries move closer to a post-Brexit trade deal.
After the signing, Ms. Truss said she was interested in hearing from Japanese businesses about where they saw future opportunities in the bilateral trade. But what we are also doing today is we are launching the start of our process for the agreement of a separate free trade arrangement with Japan. And we are launching our call for input for businesses to be able to tell us where they think the biggest opportunities are in a future trading arrangement. Post-Brexit, Japanese companies and investors will be forced to reassess their four-decade bet on the UK if it is a disorderly Brexit. Many Japanese investors are worried that the disorderly exit could turn upside down the entire business case for investing in British manufacturing. So looking at a more comprehensive picture, because the Japanese companies that are investing are global operators, and they are watching it very carefully. At the same time, they have the ability to adapt to changes. And you could, if we are told, if we have certainty and predictability. If none of the, uh, the predictability is there, then you cannot plan. So you will have to stop uh, and then consider when things are clear. On the ground, more political crisis is brewing within the Labour Party over the future of deputy leader Tom Watson, as rumours spread he could be ousted because of disloyalty over Brexit. In the course of the week, I had a chat with the UK's permanent undersecretary, Sir Simon MacDonald, on the conversation surrounding Brexit and how Britain's move could affect Nigeria. Take a listen. Sir Simon MacDonald, thank you for speaking with me. And I understand it's not your first time in Nigeria, it's actually your second. Tell us about your first and now your second. That's correct, Amarachi. I'm here in Lagos for the first time, but the second time in Nigeria. I came in 2002 with my boss, Foreign Secretary Jack Straw, and he had meetings with President Obasanjo, and as his principal private secretary, I accompanied him. Uh, so my memories of Nigeria are confined to the federal capital. So you did meet one of Africa's favorite leaders. I did. Uh, but uh, the motivation is different this time. Uh, the context of my visit is Brexit, the departure of the United Kingdom from the European Union. It's now getting very close. Uh, and uh, my visit is a signal that we are interested like never before in the rest of the world. For the last 40 odd years, the focus of the United Kingdom has been on Europe. Uh, but we know the world is bigger than Europe and we know our relations go back way beyond 1973 when we joined the European Union. So we are re-emphasizing those historic partnerships. Well, speaking about Brexit, I'd like to get your thoughts on the Supreme Court uh, processing that's going on now that's looking into the prorogation of Parliament. Uh, prorogation is a standard part of our constitution. Uh, a parliament runs for five years, usually of five one-year sessions. And at the end of each session, there is a prorogation, which resets the parliamentary agenda. Uh, then the Queen comes to parliament, makes the Queen's speech, and sets out the government's agenda for the next session. This time is a bit different. Because of Brexit, because Brexit has taken so long to agree in the British Parliament, the session just finished lasted nearly three years. So this is the longest session since the Civil War in the 17th century. So you, know, you should not be surprised that there was a prorogation because the government wanted to reset its agenda. We have a new prime minister with a new agenda. The controversy was the coincidence of this prorogation with the climax of the Brexit negotiation. So the opponents to Brexit believe that the Prime Minister was acting to close down debate in Parliament. All I will say as a civil servant is that we see from what happened at the beginning of this month that that was not the case. In the five sitting days, uh, M MPs managed to pass a very significant piece of legislation which makes it unlawful to leave the European Union at the end of October without a deal, or according to this law. 
So Parliament is still firing on all cylinders and making itself felt in British politics. There were in fact two uh, cases in uh, courts in England and Wales and in Scotland. The High Court in England and Wales agreed with the government, said that the action was lawful. In the Court of Session in Edinburgh, Scottish judges agreed with the complainants and said what the government had done, what the Prime Minister had done, was not lawful. So this week, the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom uh, sits on top of the whole system and will look at both cases and come to a final judgment. So we must wait. Uh, the Supreme Court is the final word, and whatever that word is will be accepted by all sides. So three years of uh, Brexit negotiations and still uh, no deal that everybody agrees on and, uh, well, no end in sight to what's going to happen. In the three years, there has been a great deal of negotiation. Prime Minister May brought back a deal to Parliament at the end of last year. It was voted on three times this year. Each time, Mrs May and her government lost the vote, which is why she resigned and why Prime Minister Johnson has come into power. He is basically taking the May deal uh, and making or suggesting important alterations. The biggest of those alterations, the one which he is focused on, is the Northern Ireland backstop. He wants to get rid of the Northern Ireland backstop. He's now met quite a lot of his European colleagues, including Chancellor Merkel in Berlin and President Macron in Paris and Biarritz. He's also met the Taoiseach, Leo Varadkar, and he and his team are confident that they can put together a revised deal. They're confident because the gap is quite narrow on this single issue of the Northern Ireland backstop, and time is now pressing. All sides want the departure to be with a deal, and he is determined to leave on the 31st of October. So he thinks this is the right moment. He's concentrated everybody's attention, uh, and we have about 40 days to go. But lawmakers could not agree on uh, the former Prime Minister, Mrs. Theresa May's deal. And I think the backstop, as you say, was the sticking point in that deal. Was that the only reason they didn't like the deal? Frankly, no. But at the end of a negotiation, you have to prioritize. So even though there were other aspects that Mr. Johnson and the new government disliked and continue to dislike, they are zeroing in on the backstop as the most significant issue. And in the end game, that is the thing they want to jettison. Well, since Mr. Johnson became Prime Minister, we've hardly heard him talk about the UK's policy towards Africa. Does he have a policy towards Africa? As well as being Prime Minister, Mr. Johnson used to be British Foreign Secretary. I worked for him as two years as his permanent secretary when he was in the Foreign Office. And during that time, he not only had an Africa policy, he visited Nigeria. So uh, Mr. Johnson was one of the moving forces behind our new Africa strategy. So we are devoting new resource to Africa because our future, when we're outside of the EU, will have a bigger Africa component. I think one of the policies would probably be, be the uh, two-year extension of foreign student visas, um, which was stopped during Mrs. May's uh, tenure. Uh, why the extension, and will there be other preferences for African countries uh, other than what is stated? Mr. Johnson is an internationalist. Uh, his motivation is to make sure that the United Kingdom is open to the whole world. What he disliked about membership of the European Union was that it required us to focus most on our neighborhood, and he wants us to be global Britain, so engaged all over the planet, including Africa. So this, the announcement on student visas is significant. I believe that it is the beginning of a revision of uh, such policies. Uh, it's a significant step, uh, but I don't expect it to be the last step. Will Brexit be accommodating of African migrants? We will have to wait to see for the detail of Brexit over the next months and years. But I can tell you that Nigeria will be a key partner for the United Kingdom. We want Nigeria to be a key partner. 
We already have a very close relationship. 200,000 Nigerians live in the United Kingdom. Last year, we did 5.5 billion pounds worth of business, two-way trade between Nigeria and the United Kingdom. That was up 40% on the previous year. So we have a very good basis, uh, but we're not satisfied with a good basis. We want to build on that. If there is uh, the worst case scenario, which is a no deal Brexit, would that change Britain's relations with Nigeria? What I'm saying is not that Brexit doesn't affect the relationship with Nigeria. I'm saying that Brexit makes us even keener on the relationship with Nigeria. Uh, if Brexit turns out to be uh, without a deal, of course there will be turbulence in our relations with Brussels and the EU, but that will not affect our enthusiasm for our relationship with Nigeria. Which would make you happier, uh, a no-deal Brexit or a Brexit extension into next year? I am one British citizen. My country is divided on this issue. So you would find many of my fellow countrymen and women who want one solution and many others who would prefer the other. Uh, we are working hard in government to get a deal. That is the focus and I think that will be better for all parties. And uh, finally, China's influence across the continent is growing. I've heard the US warn African leaders to be wary of China. What is the UK's position on China's influence on Africa? We believe that we can and do work well with China in Africa. So our uh, aid ministries partner on projects across the continent uh, because African development is a global interest. So I believe that it's something on which the United Kingdom and other Western countries can and must work with China. So Simon MacDonald, thank you so much for speaking with me. Thank you very much.